Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Man, it's good to uh, be here on Sunday. I've just got to be honest with you. I, um, I miss you. I cannot wait for us to be able to, to sing together again and to uh, be in this room. And, and I know the church is more than a building. It's more than a chair. But <laughs> just to be honest with you, Sundays are hard. Not because it's hard to preach to a camera. It's hard because I think the body was meant to be together and, and to sing together and to uh, corporately meet together. And so I just, I want to tell you, I miss you and I cannot wait for that time. I know uh, we're, we're looking forward to getting through this next phase so we can be in uh, this building worshiping together and the body being together again. So uh, just, just know that we love you. We miss you and we look forward uh, to uh, seeing you soon. You know, we've learned a lot over the last few weeks uh, about the church. We've learned that, that the church is more than a building. We've learned that the church is more than a chair, that all these things things, but we also have had some questions over the last few weeks. And if you haven't, let me ask you two big questions, because some questions have answers and solutions. Other questions, very honestly, they just kind of leave us hanging. But there's two big questions I stumbled on this last week as I was studying. Number one is, what in the world is God doing right here, right now? What is God doing? You've probably asked that question over the last couple of weeks. God, what are you doing right here? right now. And then the second question is, how in the world should I respond to it? How in the world should I respond to it? And you see, how you respond to these questions will shape the way you not only think about God, yourself, and life, and what is important, but it will also shape your behavior and what you surrender your life to. See, if you don't answer those two questions well, what in the world is God doing right here, right now? How in the world should I respond? If you don't answer those questions well, then you could end up living in a continual depression. Spend your life, the majority of your life, angry, sad, eaten up with envy, driven by success, focused on what others think, living a life of bitterness and regret. See, if you don't answer those questions well, you, you're going to be confused by God's promises. And you'll wonder why God didn't come through for you when you needed Him or you need Him. You see, the reason this is important to answer these questions well it's because we'll be able to understand the will of God or the agenda of God. And that, that there is the, the already and the not yet. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But this is especially true when something happens like what's happened this year. As, uh, uh, you know, we're thinking about this year started off 2020. And people are talking about all oh, 2020 vision. And, and I kind of giggle at that now because, man, if they could have only seen what was going to happen, they had to run for the hills. You know what I'm saying? And so all of a sudden now we're looking at this going, holy cow, we need to answer that question because you see that's why living in the already of our new birth in Christ and the not yet of our final journey home with our Savior is important to understand because there's the already and the not yet and we're living in that beautiful middle and if we don't answer those questions well we're not going to respond well to what God's doing. I said this over the last couple of weeks. Nothing has changed yet everything has changed. We know just as much about the future as we knew a year ago. We we know just we are just as dependent on God as we were a year ago. It's just that we simply are so much more aware of it than we ever have been. And I think what's happened for many of us is because we're so aware of it and we haven't answered those questions well, some of us live with this great hope of God and others of us have lived in this great fear 
of what's coming. And, and we're simply not resting in the comfort of the one who has not only the already, but he also holds the not yet. Our future, our hope. And we do have a hope. As we learned over the last couple of weeks, we're engaged in a spiritual battle. It's not new. And without God, we won't live. We won't survive unless God intervenes on our behalf. And there's, a, there's more to life than meets the eye. We've talked about this over the last couple of weeks that, that there's more that meets the eye than what we see out there or what you see in your back porch or outside your house right now. Paul in Ephesians says that there is a whole unseen world out there. That, and it's not the first time he mentioned it because if you go back and read Ephesians chapter 1, Paul talks about every ruler and authority and power and dominion. And his point is that Jesus is supposed superior to all those things out there that we can't see. That he is superior, that he is all in all. He is above everything. And so we know that life is a battlefield and that there's a force in this world that we can't see. And it's not a virus. It's much more sinister and dark than that. That there is a force that doesn't want you to do good. That there's a force that doesn't want you to believe in hope. It wants to rob you of your hope. There's a force at work in this world that doesn't want you to live for Jesus. And it's pulling you in all directions away from that. That doesn't want you to minister to others in his name. That doesn't want you to reflect God's love and mercy. And that force will do whatever it takes to make sure that we don't do it. Now, listen to me. And you need to hear this because we know that there's a force out there. But our enemy may be strong, but our Savior, Jesus Christ, is stronger than any other force in the universe, seen or unseen. I think that's why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, let's look at it again, verses 10 to 17, he says, a final word. In other words, I'm going to wrap all this up because I've already told you that our God, that Jesus Christ is bigger than anything you could ever think. He's over all. He is the authority. He is the all in all. So a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and put on God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. We have an enemy, but he says, listen, you're going to stand firm because we're not fighting. Here it is against flesh and blood and enemies and all the things that we, we, we spend our time on being mad out there and, and focusing on materialism. No, Paul says this, we're not fighting against that, but we're fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, world, against mighty powers of the dark world, and even and, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, Paul says, here's your strategy. Here's how you're going to win because you can't win this on your own. So therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. In other words, when it ramps up, when it's happening, man, you'll be able to resist him. He says, then after the battle, he goes ahead and he steps forward and he kind of, he says, hey, I'm going to tell you the end of the story. He says, then after the battle, you will, you will be standing firm. And I love this. I'm just like, yes, we win. Anyway, he says, stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body of God's righteousness that we talked about last week. If you missed it, go back and look at that. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news. That's the gospel. The peace comes from knowing that we have Christ's righteousness in our life, that we have the good news of the gospel, that we are saved, we have a future, so that you will be fully prepared. And by the way, look at verse 16, he says, in addition to all of these, in addition to all these, now, now listen, all these are important, but listen, you need to realize there's more to this. He says, in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop those fiery arrows of the devil and put on the salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, let's talk about faith, the shield, and then I want to talk about how not to lose your head in the battle. Amen? Because that's pretty stinking important. You don't lose your head in the battle, all right? So here he's, he's saying this, look, and all that I've already told you and everything I've already given you, these are important because it's that shield of faith. I read this last week, and I thought it was so simple, that faith simply means believing God. That's it. It simply means believing God. I mean, it, that's the bottom line of the Christian faith, to believe him. 
The bottom line of everything we do and everything we believe and everything we hold to, everything we have our confidence in, the whole of Christianity is an act of believing that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That that's our faith, believing that he gave us his word, that he wrote his word, that, that Christ is God, that he died, he rose, that he's coming again, believing, I love this, I read this, believing that by believing we can enter into a kingdom, the whole kingdom. Believing that believing, you know, this is not new. I was looking through the scripture this last week, and listen to this, in Habakkuk 2, verse 4, says that the just shall live by faith. Say faith in your living rooms this morning. The, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1, verse 17 says, the just shall live by faith. Say faith with me again. Galatians 3, 11 says that the just shall live by faith. Say faith again. Hebrews 10 says the just shall live by faith. See, listen, the shield of faith is what protects us. It's what we're putting up when those arrows are shot at us, those uncertain times come, when doubt comes, when those fiery darts of fear comes and we're, 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 we're broken and we're realizing it's that faith that God is who he says he is that we're putting up and it's blocking those fiery arrows. In fact, the scripture says that it quenches those fiery arrows that are coming at us. You see, faith is important because it's by faith that we're made right. We learned last week that it's the righteousness of Christ that our standing means that upon repentance and belief in Christ Jesus, if you'll believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that at that moment that he credits us as righteous in our faith, but it's our faith in his work that brings that righteousness in. That he works that in and we put that on. You see, faith makes us almost unpenetrable. I mean, when you begin to lack faith, that's when those arrows kind of get in. Right. Especially when we're marching along side by side. I think that's what's made this so difficult, this social distancing thing that we've done, is because the body of Christ was never meant to be distanced from each other. Mankind was not created to be distanced from each other. And during this season, it's been so hard for many of us because we are drawn to each other, because we know that in battle that we are impenetrable when we're together, locked arms, shields up, and walking together in the battle of Christ. There's something in us that's made for that. And this kind of brings me to this next one because you see Paul's talking about our behavior here with the shield. He's not just talking about, I believe, a creed. This is our behavior because, see, our belief leads to action. And so Paul's talking to us of faith in action. Our faith that has no action is not a faith at all. Faith leads to action. And that brings me to the helmet, because the purpose of the helmet, of course, was to protect your head, right? You can't battle if you lose your head in battle, right? The head's thinking important, <laughs> all right? And so we look at this, we realize that the helmet protects the head. We're in the helmet of salvation, where Paul says, put on the helmet of salvation. Now listen to me, the helmet of salvation simply means meditating on all that God has done for us, is doing for us and has planned for us. See, we've said this over the last couple of weeks, that the mind is probably the most crucial battlefield. Because when we forget what God has done for us, and we forget what God is doing for us, and we choose to not look to what God's going to do and his promises, that's when that doubt comes in. I think that's why Paul said, you've got to put this helmet on, man. Just like the helmet protects your head, your salvation does too when you meditate on it. You see, Paul is speaking to people who are already believers. He's not talking to somebody that you need to get saved here. He's talking about those who have already been saved and already been redeemed. He says, now put that salvation on. Because he's saying to those, he's saying, use your salvation to protect your head. Which is why I don't live in despair very long. I never have been. I've never been prone to depression. I've never been prone that direction. I know some of that folks struggle chemically with that. For me, it's, 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 I've not struggled chemically. But one of the reasons I don't stay there very long is simply because I realize because God protects my head. 
I remember that God's got great things. Now, it doesn't mean I don't struggle from time to time, but that's part of putting on that helmet of salvation, that this isn't all there is. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? You see, I can't give in to despair because his salvation protects me. I'm not very good at worry. In fact, I probably should worry more. Amen? In fact, sometimes I, I, I don't worry about things. It's like, it's like, dude, don't you, don't you see it? I'm like, yeah, well, God's got it. I mean, and that seems simple, but it's because I know he's got that and it protects my head. You see, that spiritual application of the helmet is so obvious that, that Paul's drawing the attention to the head, the mind, the brain, the understanding, how we think. Because what you think and how you think leads to behavior. So many of us are living in fear. I mean, you've heard over the last two months, if we do anything, if we go outside, go buy groceries, if we go out in the public, we're going to die. Okay, and listen to me. Don't miss this. You're going to die. We were laughing last night with a family that lives behind us, and about something I've always said, there's a one in one chance you're going to die. I checked it last week. It still it is a good statistic. We're all going to die. We were never guaranteed a risk-free life. Never. Life is a risk. Loving is risky. You see, the enemy is busy at work telling us that all that Jesus did to wash us and cleanse us is in vain. That you need to be scared. You need to run in fear. You might as well give up, give in. The washing of the blood of Jesus Christ is not good enough. I love what 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 says, but let us live in the light and be clear-headed, amen, protected by the armor of faith and love. Here Paul's given another analogy of the armor, protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence, the hope, maybe your version says, of our salvation. Listen, the helmet is our hope. It's the hope of our salvation. It's what Paul called the hope of glory. And what Paul's talking about here is the three tenses of salvation. Remember, we've talked about this before, that we are a people who have been saved. That's past tense. That means there's no more condemnation. Our righteousness has now been exchanged with Christ's righteousness because we didn't have any righteousness. So we have been saved in the past tense, but we're also a people who are being saved right now in the present tense. And here's the beautiful thing about this is that he didn't left this to our own to work out our sanctification. He put the Holy Spirit of God in us so that he is working out our salvation here and now, but there's also that day where we're going to be saved and that's a future tense that, 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 that this is the not yet. Remember, we have the already, we have the now, and we have the not yet. And so here we see that in justification in the past, we're no longer condemned. We're free from the law of sin. That's the already. That's done right now when we put our helmet on. We don't live under condemnation. We don't live under fear. We don't live under those lies anymore. No, we've been made new in Christ. But then there's our sanctification, the presence, the process of being holy and working out our salvation in light of what he's already done. We're working that out right now. We'll spend the rest of our life working that out. Amen? And then we have the glorification that he's coming again. That's the not yet. That's that's the beauty of the communion table, that when we take that communion, we're longing for that day that he returns, that, 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 that maybe it could be today. Amen? Yes. You see, that's what the helmet of salvation is. It's to remind ourselves we have been saved, we are being saved, and one of these days, he's coming again. Amen? Woo. That's hope. That's the hope of glory. So how do you not lose your head in the battle? So I was thinking about that. In John chapter 15, Jesus, one of the most famous passages to his disciples that we hear all the time, he says this, listen to me. He says, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who are remain or abide in me and I in them will produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So how do you not lose your head in battle? 
So here's what I want to do. I want to give you a simple way to not lose your head. You ready for this? Number one, here's what it looks like. Because that word abide means to stay, to reside, to lodge, to live, to dwell, to inhabit. And Jesus says, look, you want to live? And you abide in me. So here's what that looks like. If you're going to abide in Jesus, number one, you've got to always think about good things. And I'm not talking about mind games here. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 4.8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Paul likes that one final thing, you know. I see that over and over again in this letter. He says, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. And think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Think of your mind like a, like a TV or satellite radio. See, the channel you're watching all the time, that's what's going into your mind. And so here's what Paul's saying. Think on those things. And you know what every one of those words mean? True, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, worthy of praise. You know who that is? That's a who, by the way. That's not a thing. It's Jesus. And we're meditating and we're thinking on those things and his goodness and his righteousness. So always think about good things. Number two, begin to train your mind to think right thoughts. You've probably heard the phrase, as a man thinks, so he is. That comes from Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Sometimes that's taken out of context that we can kind of think ourselves into, into goodness. We can kind of think ourselves into something we're really not. And we can kind of think ourselves into improved life situation. It's not talking about thinking yourself into a new version of yourself. Because, listen, you, you, if you start thinking of yourself as something you're not, you're probably not that. You ever seen the guy walking around that arrives 10 minutes before he he actually gets there because the bravado gets there and he thinks he's something and then he's really not anything. See, we're not talking about that. And what he is saying here is he says, look, I want you to know that what you think determines what you believe and what you believe determines what you do. So as you think in your mind, if you're not thinking of those things, you're not doing what we said first, then, then understand that what you're, what's going on here will affect what's going on out there. So train your mind by abiding in the one who is true and consistent. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to meditate on Scripture, to memorize Scripture. I was getting up in our cabinets the other day. We, it's that time of year where ants come in, and, and we, you, know, you get that, and we freak out when ants come in because, I don't know, this is kind of creepy. And, and so we were looking for ways they were coming in, and I got up over this cabinet, over my stove top, and, and as I opened it up, and I was going to make sure they weren't up there because, you know, those little suckers get everywhere. As I opened it up, my wife had a scripture verse on the inside of this cabinet. I bet we hadn't opened that cabinet 15 times in five years. But there's a scripture verse there. So that every time we open that up, I grew up in a house where my mom, when we would get up, we got dressed in their bathroom. And so when we get up in the morning, she would take those sticky notes when they first came out in the 80s. I thought those were so cool. And, and she would take those sticky notes and she would write a scripture verse on it and she'd put it on the mirror so that when my dad, my brother, and myself would get ready in their bathroom, we were staring at scripture. You want to get your mind right. You want to get your mind on the things of, of abiding in Christ so that you don't lose your head in battle. Start memorizing Scripture. So Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not ever depart from my lips, but I will meditate on it day and night so that I will be careful to do everything written in it, and then you will be prosperous and successful. Only three times in the Old Testament is that word success used in the Hebrew, and here it's linked to memorizing God's Word. To change the way you think. Number three, always think about good things. Train your mind to think right thoughts. And number three, ignore those things you have no control over. Do you know you can do nothing about the weather? We found that out the last couple of weeks, didn't we? Do you know there's absolutely nothing you can do about what someone thinks about you? It does not matter. They're going to think what they think. Amen? You can't change that. You can love them. But at the end of the day, you can't control what somebody thinks about you. And yet, so many of us sit around so worried about what somebody thinks about us. Do you know you can really do nothing about getting COVID-19? There's absolutely, because listen, viruses don't obey. <laughs> Think about it. They don't act. They just are. Viruses run their course. 
And no matter how many precautions you take, how many pair of gloves you put on, how many masks you get, guess what? You could still get the virus because you can't control it ultimately. Now, we can do all these things to mitigate it, but ultimately we can't control it. The only thing, listen to me, the only thing we have control of in our life is our reaction to the things that happen around us. That's it. That's it. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, you ready for this? Pray. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Remember last week we talked about God and loves when we ask him. So tell him what you need and thank him for all he's done. There's the already. Here, here it comes. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So always think about good things. Begin to train your mind, <coughs> to train your mind to think right thoughts. Ignore things you have no control over. And number four, don't hang around wrong influences. Now, I know this sounds strange because we can't hang around it all together, right? So I had a good friend of mine one time I grew up as a mentor and he, he told me this and I, I've said it before, it bears repeating because it fits here. You'll become, it's a fact, you'll become like those you spend the majority of your time with. It's a fact. So let me put this in, in perspective. That includes Fox News Channel. <laughs> that includes CNN. MSNBC, ABC, PBS, that includes Snapchat, that includes TikTok, that includes Facebook, Twitter, and guess what? It actually includes actual living, breathing people. <laughs> I know. What you listen to most, what you listen to most is what is affecting your thinking. And some of us have some stinking thinking because we're not abiding in Jesus. Amen? And that eventually will affect your behavior. Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate or hang out with fools, you get in trouble. I'll let you fill in the blank of that list I just gave you, which ones are fools. Proverbs 14, 7, stay away from a fool, for you'll not find knowledge on his lips. But Paul writing to young Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 22 and 24 says, flee the evil desires of youth. In other words, grow up. Grow up. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Who are you hanging out with? During this season, who are you hanging out with? Because you'll begin to think like those you spend the majority of your time with, which will lead to behavior. So be careful. Don't hang out with the wrong influences. And lastly this morning, always think about good things. Begin to train your mind to think right thoughts. Ignore things you have no control over. Don't hang around with wrong influences. And lastly, encourage mind renewal. Now listen to me. In other words, think like Christ. I love what Romans 12, 2 says. Do not change yourselves to be like the people of this world. Did you hear that? Do I need to run through that list again? Don't change yourselves to be like the people of this world. But be changed from within by a new way of thinking. The only way you're going to be changed from within is through Christ Jesus. And then he says this, then you'll be able to decide what God wants for you. You'll know what is good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. Look at those three things that will change the way you think. Thinking like Christ, what he has done, doing right now, we'll, soon, very soon, we'll do very soon. He says this, if you'll abide in me, you'll change the way you think. You'll be able to decide what God wants for you. This is good stuff, man, that you will know what is good and pleasing to him and you will know what is perfect. And by the way, it's the mind where this needs to take place. You see, Romans 12, 2 helps us answer those questions. What in the world is God doing right here, right now? You want to know that? Then begin to change your mind and think like Christ. And how in the world should I respond? Begin to change your mind and think like Christ. Amen? Amen. See, sometimes we make this so difficult. See, some of you need to turn the volume down of some of those voices TV, talk radio, 97.5. There you go. I said it. <laughs> Turn it down. Start abiding in Jesus. Meditating on him. 
See, no matter how bad things may seem today, I know because of the salvation of Jesus Christ, I know that what Jesus has done and he's doing, that these things are temporary, that this too shall pass, that this is not come to stay. You see, his promises ultimately a bright and beautiful future for all of us, not because of who we are, but because of what he's done, that he's coming back and I can't wait. So I would say to you today, because I wanted, you know, the elders and I were talking this last week, and I was asking them and, and, and seeking their covering and, and having them pour into me, and they kept saying this, give them hope, Edward. Give them hope. Keep giving hope. And so listen, the hope that we have today is putting on that helmet of salvation, of knowing what's already, knowing what's now, and knowing the not yet. But he's coming again. This is not all there is, that we have hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? What is God doing right here, right now? He's doing exactly what he's always done. He is making much of the Son. And people are asking questions. In fact, some of you may be watching today, and you've watched this over the last five, six weeks, and you're doing it in the privacy of your home. You're going, wow, these guys aren't as crazy as we thought they were. And some of you are going, wow, they're crazier than we thought they were. I know, I get it. See, some of you are watching for the first time, and you're beginning to wonder, gosh, God, what are you up to? I'll tell you what he's up to. He's up to drawing you to Jesus, because that's what he's always been about. And if you'll believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what will happen? You will be saved, if you'll believe. You see, it's that helmet that protects us, hope. You see, the world's coming to a standstill, does nothing but compel people to ask, where's God? And church, listen to me. He's here. And he wants to live in your friends and your family. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And listen, if you are saved, you have the already and you're in the present and the hope is coming, then go and share that hope. I loved what Steve prayed this morning as he was praying over communion that we would have courage, that we would have courage to be aware of those conversations that we're having with people and share that Jesus Christ is our hope. So as you live this week and you go about this week, put on that helmet. Remember what he did. Remember what he's doing, that the Holy Spirit lives in us. And there's coming a day, church, amen, we're passing through. This is in our home. We're passing through to a greater hope, to hope of glory when Jesus Christ returns. Amen? amen. Let's pray together. So, Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you didn't leave this for us to just figure out. You gave us a game plan. And so, Lord, I pray for those that are listening this morning, that are going to listen this week, that are going to listen over the next few weeks, that, God, if they do not have a relationship with you, that, God, you would give them courage to believe on your name, that your Holy Spirit would woo them. And maybe you're sitting here watching this morning, and, yeah, I'm talking to you now, look at me, is that maybe this morning is your morning to be saved, this morning that you can believe right there in your, in your living room. Or maybe in that coffee shop you're listening to. That you would believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because you are a sinner and you're broken. You know that. And the only way we can be forgiven and the only way we can be made whole is by surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ. And so if you do that this morning, right where you're sitting, we'd love to know. We would love to walk that journey with you. And so you can fill out that decision card that's there on our website or it's in the feed below as you're watching right now. We would love to walk that journey with you. And if you already have made that journey, you've already surrendered your life to Jesus, but you're just struggling, then we'd love to pray for you. Take a moment and fill out that decision card and we'll pray for you. We have still our team prays on Mondays and all during the week. We'd love to pray for you. So God, thank you. As we sing this last song, as we worship you, God, help us be faithful this week as we feed people, as we love on people, as we minister to people. God, we love you. And we ask it in that beautiful name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to 
uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.